Yo, Ralph. Hello. What's up, Pete? How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me on today. I'm super pumped, man. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a rollicking good time here talking about SDR awesome sauce. I think that's what I said. I said we we, we promised the Power Hour audience that SDR awesome sauce, and we will definitely deliver. Um, so while while folks are kind of joining us here, um, I, I know that you have a band. What is it called again? Segway. Ah, oh, yes, my band is called Segway. S E G U E. Oh yeah, like the this the the the. Uh, the, the the silly personal transporter kind of like messed that up for you guys like you know goofballs yep <laughs> silly is a great word uh it's also misspelled <laughs> exactly um do you guys have any shows recently yes in fact we played uh, a week ago friday we played in lake tahoe at the crystal bay casino it was the first oh, time awesome. we'd, we'd played in some time and uh, it was a blast that's awesome. What, um, where's Crystal Bay? Is that, uh, is that like Tahoe city area or is that like the Northern state line or what's the deal? Is that a, yeah, Oh, it's, it's a casino. So I guess that's obvious. Right. Northern state line, just next to uh, the old Cal Neva that I uh, was recently bought by Larry Ellison. <laughs> Larry Ellison bought the Cal Neva. He casino. bought the Cal Neva. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> and is he, and he's just going to like knock the damn thing down and like, you, you know, build a house for himself or something because he probably great already question. has like... <laughs> great it's honestly it's just a piece of property that's just abandoned sitting there with a giant fence around it i don't know what he's gonna do oh it wasn't operational anymore i had no idea that's no. like clear i think i i think i went to a conference there like a while. i think actually lever might have had their um their like sko at some point there but anyway that's hilarious <laughs> that's tumbleweed well, i guess now it, oh man i guess you're not gonna be i guess segway is not gonna be playing there um uh, awesome no. <laughs> uh yeah not so much uh, yeah. um killer all right well, we'll get this party started um so hey everyone thanks for joining us for uh modern sales power hour on pika zanji um so just for like a little bit of a context for folks um this is a you know the idea of this this event is to make sure that we have good audience participation so please do use the chat panel we've got ralph here we've got myself here to answer all of your burning uh sdr um you know operational excellence questions um, or any other kind of questions, maybe like, uh, you know, uh, how to tune your guitar, you know, the best way to deal with like, you know, scheduling gigs, all those sort of things. But so do, do please use the chat, do use the Q&A panel. Um, for folks who are maybe not familiar, uh, Power Hour is hosted by Modern Sales Pros. MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales revenue operations, sales development, and related disciplines. And so the community's mission is to create an environment for our 27,000 and growing members to answer questions they'd struggle to solve on their own, help them see around corners they may not know about, you know, just get better. That's what we're all about, getting better. Right. And so the way the way that we do that is through great life sessions, like what you're about to experience here uh, through a robust online forum and also in person events. And so for those who weren't previously admitted, um, we'll you know, be adding you to the uh, to the community after this. And so before we get started, um, Power Hour is a you know, fairly unique format. It's not really you know, a specific piece of content that we're talking through. The idea here is to answer kind of any kind of burning questions that you might have. We had a bunch of questions that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, but you're here to learn, so please do use that Q&A. Please do use the, um, the chat panel. Um, and, and of course, you can just listen as well. So with that, let's go ahead and head into some introductions here. Um, my name's Pete Kazanji. I am one of the founders of Atrium. We make data-driven sales management software that exists to help managers use data to improve team performance. So AE, SDR, AM, CSM managers and leaders to, to use metrics and data to improve the performance of their, their reps and their teams. Um, one of the cool things about Atrium is it's super easy to set up. You just log in with your Salesforce credentials and with fi within five minutes, Atrium will show you how your reps are performing across hundreds of metrics. Um, so we're big sales nerds over here. Uh, also, I'm the founder of Modern Sales Pros, as kind of noted earlier. Um, and uh, you know, previously wrote a book on startup sales called Founding Sales. So that's a little bit about me. You guys have heard about me before. For those who haven't, now you know me. Hi, what's up? Um, I'm super pumped to have our illustrious guest here today, uh, Mr. Ralph Barsky, who is uh, absolutely fantastic. You know, the guru of sales development himself. Uh, Ralph, you want to give folks a little bit of a rundown of you know what you're spending your time on now at Trey, a little bit of your background um, before that, and then we can kind of get into some of the topics. 
Yeah, happy to, Pete. So first things first, uh, thank you for all the contributions you've made to our profession, uh, not just with Atrium, but obviously Modern Sales Pros, the book, uh, just your your relentless involvement in what we're doing uh, on behalf of a lot of people. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, and thanks for having me on. Uh, just a bit about me. Uh, I center a lot of my work uh, in the sales development world, as Pete said. Uh, I've been in sales for close to 30 years, so I'm aging myself a bit, but uh, pretty much the first <laughs> half of my career was uh, spent as an individual contributor, and uh, the latter half was spent mostly on uh, building and leading sales development organizations. Uh, I am at Trey.io in San Francisco. Uh, we're in the integration automation space. Uh, and I oversee the sales development organization at Trey. Prior to that, I was at ServiceNow, uh, where I uh, built and led their uh, global sales development organization, uh, which was quite a run and quite a ride. Uh, and prior to that, uh, <laughs> held a number of different uh, sales development leadership roles at, at some popular SaaS companies here in the Bay Area. And I've had the privilege to be able to advise and consult a lot of companies uh, outside of work, which is really been fun. So it's great to be here. I hope I can, I can help the audience today. Well, I think one of the things that's particularly compelling about, uh, I mean, aside from your shirt and, you know, the fact <laughs> that you're such a tal talented uh, musician and of course the haircut um, <laughs> is you and I, you and I have matching haircuts. Um, I just have a hat on. It ain't the, easy to um, <laughs> Aerodynamic. Um, the, um, um, I, I think like you, you've had experience with like all sizes of, of sales development organizations like the tray one right now is like you know a dozen folks or so i think tray is like post series b or post series c i want to say so like there's that and of course like service now is like crazy right like you know many hundreds of uh of sales development folks uh or sales development reps so i think that like you know a lot of times people kind of like pick a lane and they're just like on their merry way. And so like the fact that you've seen it all, because like there's different things at different points in time, right? Like when you're small, it's like chaos, right? And like, you're trying to like drive, you know, drive any sort of consistency. And when it's large, it's about like alignment and like paint within the lines and like, you know, <laughs> don't actually be necessarily be super innovative. I need you to do these things right, right here. So I'm particularly pumped about that. Um, I guess kind of to start things off here, um, you know, I think if if anybody also if anybody's a uh, a Twitter uh, you know a Twitter person, um, Ralph is a fantastic follow because he's such a positive human being, and we can all use more positivity and like uh, you know and like uh, gratitude in our lives. So like Ralph is a fantastic Twitter follow in that regard. Um, so definitely definitely do that. But. You think a lot about sales, like you think about a lot, a lot about leadership and a lot about coaching. What are some of your favorite leadership topics, like sales leadership topics as of late? Uh, appreciate that. Uh, you know, I think um, you, you hit it right on the head when you talked about the different sizes and phases that companies and yeah. teams are in. So uh, it kind of depends on the chapter that you're at in your career or in your life or, you know, what, what section you're dealing with or what phase you're dealing with right now. But you know, what's funny, you asked about leadership topics, and it always comes back to the same ones. It's like, how do you maintain a culture of performance? How do you maintain high morale on the team? How do you ensure that everybody knows which way north is? It, it, that's agnostic with respect to the different chapters. You will always land on those topics. So they remain right. some of my favorite ones to talk about and work on. And so I think that's a good one. Like, you know, let's let's just use culture of high performance as an example what are some of like the, the the you know your favorite tactical mechanisms by which to engender you know in, it's like engender and then like persist yeah <laughs> it's it has a good to be one. consistent it can't just be like a spike and be like all right cool it's got to be like a habit um what are some of your favorite mechanisms by which to to engender that and persist it well, I, I think it's really important, like I mentioned earlier, that everybody knows which way north is. And it sounds pretty mm -hmm. easy, but uh, it reminds me of a seminar I went to many years ago with Dr. Stephen Covey, who wrote, uh, uh, what was sure. it, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He gets yep. up in front of the audience and he says, okay, I want everybody to just put your left hand over your eyes. And with your right hand, I want you to point north, then drop the left hand from your eyes and look around the room. Yeah, there you go, Pete. And everybody, That's however, nice. is pointing everywhere. They're all over the <laughs> map. <laughs> yeah. And he said, look, this is how so many different organizations are run. We walk around through the organization 
through the quarter, through the year, et cetera, thinking we know which way north is and what the mission is to get north when mm -hmm. we couldn't be more further from the truth. And so one of the first things I like to do when I parachute into an organization is establish which way is north, where it is we're headed and why we're headed there. And then uh, other mechanisms that I'll implement along with my leadership team include standards of excellence. We want to raise our standards. We want to lead by example. And so we break standards into four pieces. They all start with the letter P. There's performance, there's process, there's proficiency, and there's professionalism. And we actually measure and manage our entire team in those four areas. So those are examples of some things that I look to, to just ensure everybody is lifting all boats. Uh, when I think about some of the things that can like trip up SDR organization, we literally just went through an OKR exercise with my leadership team the other day. So I'm thinking about it from a leadership standpoint, but then of course, like for most of us here, you know, talking today, it's like, I've got a six person SDR team. I got a 20 person SDR team. I've got a, you know, whatever, um, yeah. probably some of the, you know, the, the places where people kind of get confused on, on, on North is like, cool. What are we here to like, what, what is an ideal opportunity look like? Right. Yep. Like, yeah. And like, right. what, like, what are the, like, what are the criteria? Like really crystalline. Like, I'll give you an example, right? Like we actually have um, a scoring algorithm. I'm like overstating the case, but like, literally we have like an op scoring mechanism where like our SDRs know that, you know, an ideal opportunity for, for Atrium is going to be a sales organization that is on Salesforce because we only support Salesforce as a CRM integration right now. Um, but, you know, sales organization that's on Salesforce that has, where um, SDR plus AE is greater than five, but mm -hmm. less than 500. Because like once you get up into like, you know, super crazy land, you end up with like, you know, messed up CRMs and all sorts of like, you know, craziness. And then moreover, so like, that's the first thing, right? Like those are like minimum qualification criteria, like inclusion in and then like kick out. And mm -hmm. then the second piece is like, how good is this op? And so literally what they'll do is they look at how many um, how many AEs, how many SDRs, and then how many sales operations people there are in the organization. Because it's like super trivial to just like look at that on like LinkedIn sales app. Just do a little bit of math, right? So I think it's like, you know, uh, multiply by two for uh, AEs, multiply, and then like, you know, multiply by one for SDRs. And then like every sales operations person is a plus five or something like that. And it gives it just like a very rough op score there. And then, the, the, and like, we have this all templated out in um in like a guru card or whatever and then they just like pasted it and like when they when they're creating the opportunity they um you know they just paste it in the new op you know new op uh creation notes which of course then travels along to the account executive it like fires out by a like the new opportunity creation notification like fires out by email fires out by troops etc but the point is is that like it's very crystallinely defined like what's in what's out right and then also hey like show my work such that a like I can be aware of it, but that also my downstream account executive or whatever can be aware of it as well, like what program they participated in, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an example of something where like I think a lot of times organizations can like trip over themselves by just like not being very crisp around like what's acceptable versus not. Where are other areas that people kind of trip on themselves and and like ways that you've seen, you know, remediating said tripping? Yeah, no. So first of all, uh, I love that formula. I, I I'm reminded of my friend Craig Rosenberg, his his company, his former company, Topo. Uh, one of their Craig's mantras, the uh, one of their mantras was specificity wins. So if you can't be specific about that. which which way north is, and then backing into who a qualified opportunity is to our business, you know it's going to be a steep climb. So make sure you nail that. And then you yeah. brought up another great point about showing your work. So. If I'm going to pass the baton to you, Pete, as my account yeah. executive, and I've just teed up an opportunity for you, but I've not shown the work I've done in the conversations I've had, I liken it to, you know, you go to visit a physician and the physician's assistant comes in, <laughs> takes the blood pressure, temperature, weighs you, all that jazz, <laughs> writes it all on the document that then goes to the doctor. So when the doctor comes in to visit you, if they don't have all that stuff on their medical record for you, they're like, so, hey, Pete, why are you here today? What are we doing? And it's like, <laughs> dude, I just did all these tests with your assistant. That's why I'm yeah. here. Uh, so the SDRs have to do that diagnosis, at least get things started so that when you do hand that medical record to the AE, they could pick things up from where they left off. Uh, and it also 
is going to delight the prospect and their uh, experience. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, those yeah. are some things that we do. Yeah. The, um, the SDRA handoff is always like hilarious. Cause like, it, well, we're, so there is the recording of the information. So like, first we got to like know what our ICP is. And I love that about the specificity wins. You saw yeah. that Craig just got a new gig at a, at scale venture partners, right? Did you see that? I did just see that. And they're lucky to have it. Awesome. Oh my yeah. gosh, I know. I'm sure he was like bored out of his mind at Gartner. Sorry, I didn't I didn't say that out loud. Um what's but, that um, over oh there? Man. What is that? Oh, yeah, what are, what's Godzilla? Um yeah. the uh oh man, that's gonna be so awesome because like he's over there and then uh and then Brandon O'Sullivan is over there helping out some uh some um, um, some portfolio companies as well. Like Scale is definitely making moves with respect to like GTM excellence, which is which is pretty great to to see. Actually, Craig yep. is going to be speaking at the MSP Virtual Summit in October. He's going to be on a uh, an operating partner panel with him, Doug Landis, uh, Travis Bryant from Redpoint. It'll be a it'll be a it'll be a goat rodeo. Um, All great, but all good ones. Yeah. But like the funny thing is like the recording thing of it, it's like, okay, that's all well and good, but someone's got to read the goddamn thing. And I think that um, oftentimes AEs can like really screw that up. And so one of the things that I enforce, and this, I guess this goes to like alignment, right? One of the things that like, I'm a, so specificity wins, I'm a big documentation guy. And, and it's funny, you had mentioned a standard of excellence, which of course is like a Bill Walsh phrase. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I know you grew up in the, in the Bay Area, so you must be a Niners fan. Uh, yep. And I'm a huge, huge Bill Walsh, um, you know, you know, the score takes care of itself, process, yep. you know, trust the process. Coaching um, tree. You know, uh -huh, yeah, I'm a big, big, big acolyte of all that. And, um, and so, you know, I'm a big documentation guy. And so of course we have our first call, document like our first call process documented for our AEs like crazy and a really important component of it is pre-call planning right and pre-call planning means consuming the new operation notes because guess what like the SCR didn't just do that for funsies right like it's there like they did work when maybe they did some like lightweight we actually do this thing that we call pre-disco um mm. where like once we once we get somebody on the hook um We'll like ask them a question. We'll just we actually ask them about their priorities. Like, hey, do, do any of these like ring a bell right now? Like, resonate any of these like top of mind? And like, you know, fifty percent of the time they won't reply, and that's fine. And fifty percent of the time they will reply, and they'll be like, actually, I just hired ten account executives, and I'm and what's really really top of mind for us right now is instrumenting the health of their ramps. So mm, then that of yeah. course goes into the new operation because that's key atrium use case. And so then the AE needs to consume that and be like, okay, got it. I have an intent. I'm setting an intention before the snap happens here that I'm going to make sure to really hammer on ramping, AE ramping, or, you know, uh, daily driven one-on-ones or, you know, fill in, fill in the blank there, but they have to do that. And so, you know, we're big on, on making sure that that's documented. Um, the compliance, like authentication on that is like, maybe not like as, as there as you could be. And I guess that's like, actually where like gong trackers or like chorus trackers and kind of things like that come in where you can kind of see if like things are being, um, things are being mentioned or whatever, but like, that's, it's like, if you're going to ask these guys to do the work down here, we got to ask these other guys and gals over here to make sure that they're, you know, taking their, you know, they're, they're actually taking the hand off and running with it as opposed to fumbling the ball. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot we can uh, get into right there. Uh, the the pre-mortem, I think, is very underrated. And mm. uh, not only for the handoff between SDR and AE, but let's say you're doing a land and expand play and two years go by, you know, and a contract might be up for renewal and you think there's an, an opportunity to upsell or cross-sell this prospect. Mm. The CSM is going to go in and the A player CSMs are going to take a look at those pre-mortem conversations from two years ago. And if there is no documentation or chronicling of the conversation, again, yep. you're starting from scratch, you're losing value in terms of credibility and rapport with the client, and they're likely going to churn. So you have to yep. keep that long term in mind. It's super critical. Another thing you brought up is, uh, you know, well, one thing that it brought up in my mind rather is we, we want to mitigate funnel constipation. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't want all these early stage <laughs> opportunities. Make, oh, oh my God. Can we make a t-shirt or a hat that says funnel? Con like, 
I think I think I know what emojis would be on it. Okay, keep yeah, going. Me too. Me too. Thanks. It would definitely get attention. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you don't want you don't want the top of the funnel like inflating and swelling up with all these discoveries that have not yet happened. Uh, mm. Even though the criteria has been met, you want to make sure that it continues to move through the funnel, and that is what happens when an account executive really takes a, a good pre mortem to heart and runs with it. Uh, so. You know, you see the funnel constipation problem, you see, you know, a, a low win rate, you see a problem with churn, you see a problem with uh, landing and expanding, and the smart operators are going to line check that system, and they're going to double check that compliance uh, was adhered to early stages, you know, in the early conversations. So the documentation is critical, the criteria being specific. Uh, that's very critical as well. And like you said, showing the work, doing the work, having the internal conversations after the pre-mortem, which is called a post-mortem, super, super important if you want to streamline your operation. Yeah, the, uh, the, the thing on the, C the CS thing that you mentioned, um, it's not just like, a, yeah, like making sure that that documentation was there initially. One of the things that I tell my team about all the time is like, like set future you up for success. So there's like us right now, and then there's us in three months or six years or nine months, or 12 months or whatever. Yep. And so it's like, take actions now such that when you wake up in a year, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, Ralph, Ralph back in August, 2022, he was so thoughtful. He set me, Ralph, up for success. And so one of the things that we, we do in that regard, we have these, um, so most of our CS function are um, either former sales operations people or have been like trained in sales operations because like essentially what we do is like, you know, people buy Atrium in order to help their, their sales organizations be more data driven. Uh, and that's really kind of like, what do the kids call it these days? A vibe right? It's like a yes. whole thing. It has to like, it, it has to like, it has to imbue the organization. So people will buy Atrium for very specific use cases. Like, Hey, we want to implement like score, like metric scorecarding for our SDRs such that our, you know, such that our managers can use it. It's like, okay, wonderful. We'll start with that. But there's like so much more that you could do around it. Like, okay, what about like measuring the ramp of your SDRs, the quality of their execution or like their multi-threading or like, you know, fill in these things or like, okay, what about the AE team? And like, are they prospecting or, you know, they're, you know, okay, how do you, how do you do QBRs with metrics? We don't. Okay, great. And so what ends up happening is our CS organization. So that's why it's like, it's like you start with a single use case and then you kind of like permeate the organization. Um, it's a vibe, so it's really, dude. It's the vibe. It's just got to be everywhere, right? It's a vibe. Yeah. It's a way of life. Um, and so, um, and so what's really important though, is like, as you're doing that, you have to know what has been deployed and what has been cared about. And so what they, what they do, and so the important thing is to make it easy AF to do that. So one of the ways that we do this with our CS team, and I think this is something, if there's anybody who's, if there's any sales operators who are, who are with us today, is just like thinking about how to make it as easy as possible to record these things. So in our case, we have this concept of a, it's a task, it's a Salesforce task of subtype um, uh, customer success play. And then we have another pick list field that's like 50 different play types or whatever. And instead of like having to manually go and like record those tasks, we'd literally have like a Salesforce flow that's like, there's a button on the contact object. They get off a call. They're like, cool, we did these two plays. We did like a AE ramping play. And then we also deployed, you know, a pipeline, a couple pipeline hygiene assets that are now being used in one-on-ones and broadcasting to the team is like record, record. And so what ends up coming back, like they come back in 12 months and they're like, or sorry, they come back in six months to do like the QBR. And it's like, duk, 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 like here's yeah. all the awesome sauce, right? Yeah. That has been. And so, but the, I think the important thing is like, you want to make it as easy as possible for your team to, to do these things. So like, if it's, you're talking about SDRs, you got like, got to make sure that they have a template for, you know, that new op creation. And if you're talking about AEs, it's like, you know, being crisp or like our AE team uses scratch pad. And then in order to like update all the relevant fields over in the op and what have you, or if you're talking about like, you just want to make it as easy as possible because then those folks will actually record it versus like it just going off into ether. <laughs> yeah. On the, on the back end, it's certainly going to help because obviously you could run reports from those pick lists and then you could spot trends, gaps, et cetera. But I think the real issue, which is what you're talking about is just actually inputting all that data. Uh, and making yep. that uh, simple to do. That's really tough. I mean, when I was an AE back in the day, I would carve out 
8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Saturday mornings to input all my data into our CRM. And uh, it sucked, but it really paid on the back end. And it speaks to something you talked about earlier about kind of making sure that you honor your future self. Same applies to the business. You know, you want to honor uh, your customer two years from now and your company two years from now, and you reap what you sow. So if you're not planting healthy seeds now by inputting the important data and doing a lot of the heavy lifting, it's going to hurt everybody in the long run. And you certainly don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, we have a really good question here from John. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out here because I know that you'll have opinions on this, Ralph. Okay. I know you will. What's up, um, John? Essentially, uh, account-based, right? Um, so a lot of, you know, ABX vendors out there, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What are good resources to help people transition from a like lead-based thinking to, um, to account-based, to account-based thinking? And I, I, let's just constrain this to like to top of funnel. Um, sure. What are some good mechanisms that you would recommend for folks who are kind of like moving away from like lead centric to, to account, like account-based, what, what does Lars call it? Account-based sales development? He does ABSD, yes. ABSD kind of sounds like B, B, sounds like a little close to BDSM, but yeah, I mean it's large. <laughs> so what do you want? <laughs> he knows what he's doing. Uh, with respect yeah. to mechanisms on ABM and ABX, uh, it's kind of old school the way I approach it, and I and I the way I've seen it done well. Uh, essentially, it's um, sorting by vertical. It's sorting by persona. And it's keeping yep. things simple. In other words, don't try to boil the ocean by selling to 10 different verticals. Maybe for this month or this quarter or even this fiscal year, you focus on two to three verticals. And sure. you immerse yourself in the critical business issues and trends uh, that those verticals are facing. And then you drill into the specific personas and the challenges that they're facing. When you're approaching an account, for example, don't think of one persona. Think of the three to five personas exactly. that you know either benefit or hurt from the systemic impact of decisions made by your key persona. That way you can right. have a number of different conversations. Uh, another thing that's old school is you might even want to grab you know a stack of post-it notes and your top mm. 10 accounts, you actually write them down or you print out the logo on your printer and you tape them on your laptop monitor or your mirror in your bathroom and you don't take that logo off until you've booked a meeting there had a, re, a you know a good conversation with that persona or account or with that vertical however you want to slice it but you got to kind of get old school uh that i've seen that work at multiple organizations that kind of approach uh, as it relates to abx i love it yeah i think the way that um so i talk about this a little bit in the prospecting chapter of founding sales um around like how like how do you identify your accounts and so one of the ways you can identify accounts is based like you can i call it account first or human first hmm. i always get people always make fun of me for using the word human but it's okay so it's like how are you identifying the account that cares about this because like the organization is going to be the thing that buys but then the humans within the organization are going to be the things that care and so that might be you know like you were just talking about the like certain verticals that you that you might start with it might be hey, um, you know, uh, this account has, uh, you know, these uh, technological, technological characteristics, right? Like it might be they have like the, these technographic characteristics because they've got, gosh, I don't know what would be, like, let's say that we're like qualified or like drift or whatever. It's like, okay, cool. If you've got Marketo live or you've got like Salesforce part out live um, or if you've got HubSpot live, like we care about you. If you don't have any of those live, we don't care about you. Or we will care about you eventually, but not right now. Okay, bye. Um, and so like that's, that might be the first thing. And then, so then once you know who the accounts are that we you know, potentially care about, then it's about um, identifying the personas who are within that account. So I'll use Atrium as an ex as an example here. We know that an organ like an organization that we care about would, um, you know, as I said earlier, have you know, SDR plus AE is greater than or equal to five, all the way up to like 500. Probably the sweet spot is SDR. But like where things start getting really kind of fun is where, when you can no longer keep keep your reps in your brain. 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's like SDR plus AE is like greater than 10 at that point. Like now you got to start, now you really got to start managing by metric because like, you know, you can't just do it by like vibe. Uh, you can't just no. do it by, uh, <laughs> by, by via, via osmosis. So then what we'll do is then we'll identify. So then we know who the human personas are. Like those are the ones who care. And that's like SDR manager, SDR leader, AE manager, AE leader, sales operations, sales enablement. Right. And so we actually have the, we have an offshore mechanism that does this. So like, we'll just take accounts, kick it off to the offshore team who do all the contact identification. Like they have a LinkedIn sales nav. Actually there's like, I think like a half dozen of them. Um, and it's just like, they go through and just like identify the contacts in question, um, you know, rip the contact information that comes back over the wire to go to go to the SDRs or the AEs or whatever and it's just like it's like here and so then what you can do is you can multi-thread across those folks sorry at least the 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 ingredients are there and then then what they have to have is the relevant per persona sequence there in order to go after those folks because like if you're going to do the calories there you might as well pull it all the way through right and like not hit these folks with like a generic sequence like that's just silly pants Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so now you're able to like, and then, and then the next thing you got to do is you got to measure that multi-threading. Right. Um, and that's worth, so like one thing is a writing and a, you know, and a scripting and an outreach on a sales loft. Are you guys an outreach or a sales loft shop or, or something else? Outreach. Outreach. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. like that exercise. And then there's the measurement component. That's like a, you know, like an atrium or a, you know, BI thing or whatever. It's like, okay, cool. I'm doing all this work to give you all these contacts. Are you then taking the actions that are required to multi-thread them? Because then I would see that in your metrics that your average contacts engaged per account is 3.5, is which is what we expect. And uh oh, Bobby's at 1.7. Huh? Why are you only hitting 1.7 contacts per account? So like that's how I think about it is like, who are the human personas? Mm -hmm. Make sure that we have the relevant messages. Um, sorry, who are the human personas that ought to be identified? Are we identifying them such that we can actually shoot at the ducks on the pond? And then do we have the relevant, you know, uh, communications lined up for them? And then are we delivering those, those relevant communications? That's kind of how I, um, how I approach that. Um, uh, did you have something you wanted to add to that, Ralph? Just that uh, it makes perfect sense to take that approach. Uh, an old sales leader of mine used to call that orging it out. You've got to org mm -hmm. out your key accounts. And I think something that's a little underrated in uh, what you said that I want to emphasize is the copywriting aspect and the communication aspect. So mm -hmm. that the relevant sequences for each uh, persona are taken a little more seriously. Uh, yep. I think we could be as a profession better writers uh, we could be a little sure. more succinct, a little more concise and a little more pointed totally. and relevant to the personas. I think uh, uh, just, I can attest from my own experience. I see a lot of sloppiness uh, at, at high volume, which is frightening because uh, there are so many sales <laughs> development reps that I take to heart as representative of me and of my team, because yeah. we're in the same profession and uh, a lot of people make us look bad. <laughs> That's like Seriously. what Richard Harris talks about accelerating the suck right yeah. all you're doing Size is acceler nuts. all you're doing it all you're doing is accelerating the suck yeah um i think that's uh i think that's fair um on on the topic of making sure that the content is aligned though um mm -hmm. you and i were kind of talking about this before we started a little bit um about you know sdr living in um you know in sales land or sdr living in in marketing land um like our sdr team lives in marketing land for us and i and I mean, part of it is because we're, we're a small organization and our VP of marketing is, you know, very capable. And so, you know, he just, he's like taking that because I had like 13 account executives reporting to me because I don't know, I, I, I like to be mean to myself. Um, <laughs> don't have that anymore. We have a new VP of sales. who's amazing. Um, but, um, but I think that like the more, like it can be a superpower because the more content and the more plays you're able to run, the more, and the more micro you can get, of course, like now your conversions are going to get higher. Right. So instead of having a generic sequence, we have um, per, per like we have five, we have five sequences, you know, one for each persona. And in fact, maybe actually we have like four sequences mm -hmm. for each of those five personas mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on the use cases. Oh, you said that thing like, oh, I saw that you just hired a bunch of SDRs. Um, Ms. SDR leader. 
oh, I saw that you guys just hired a bunch of SDRs, Mr. Sales Operations Manager. I saw that you just hired a bunch of SDRs, uh, Ms. Sales Leader. And then they have like different ramifications. Like to the SDR managers, like, man, I bet that's like chaos for you. And like, you know, you're busier than a one-legged kickboxer. For the sales ops person, it's like, <laughs> oh, I bet you're probably being asked for a bunch of reporting and like instrumentation. And for the sales leader, it's like, man, you probably really want to track the ramp of this to make sure your investment's coming back. Right. But like, so now you've got this like content matrix, right? And so, I mean, obviously like marketers are are like the word people. And so if you like the more complicated your your motion is in that regard, maybe the more it makes sense for it to be um, in marketing land. Um, where have you kind of seen, like, I think you said that you've done both. I've done both. And uh, my disclaimer, Pete, is that there's no silver bullet. You know, I've seen no. pros, and, pros and cons to both. Uh, rolling into marketing is... Uh, uh, very viable in that, you know, marketing is a key contributor to the revenue pipeline, as is sales development, uh, just as a standalone function. It's a, it's a major pipeline contributor. Uh, on the flip side, you know, it's great for sales development to roll into sales because most, not all, but most sales development reps are aspiring to become individual contributors. They want to be account executives uh, sure. and carry a bag. So there's benefits to both. Uh, you know, sales is relying a lot on those pre-mortems we talked about and uh, illustrating maybe a selling methodology that the entire company uses. Not that marketing isn't, but sales really has emphasis on that selling methodology uh, finding that critical business issue early in the process, et cetera, uh, and un, you know, uncovering the the um, uh, the problems and impact of doing things the way they're doing it today, and uh, you know, I, I can see a lot of sales development reps kind of adopting that early in their talk tracks, and then obviously carrying it into an AE role in the future. So I mean, they both work. Yeah. Um, the way, yeah. The way said, that we. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Pete. Sorry to interrupt. There's one thing I wrote down when you said the marketers are the word people. They are, yeah. but we've got to change that. I mean, the sales Agree. people have got yeah. to be the word people too. For oh, the they're the word lot. people. Yeah. No, we're communicators. That's what I tell my reps all the time. Like we are professional communicators. We either, we do it this way, like yep. runtime with our mouse, but yep. also this way. Yep. Like it's, it's, it's too it's yin and yang. Totally. Amen. How brother. do you make people better at that? Oh, well, you um, focus on it. You know, it's like you're not focusing on your left earlobe until right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I said it. That's how easy it is. So if, yeah, if you, if you present to the team as a sales development leader, like, hey, we've got to get better at copywriting and we're going to start paying attention to how your sentences are crafted and we're going to shed light and provide some guidance when and where needed. But we're going to finish this month better writers than we were last month and last quarter. Uh, and we're going to highlight the winners. We're going to highlight the ones who are really uh, implementing what we're, what we're trying to do because you are representing the entire company and its brand and the brand of our team. So let's get good at writing. And that might mean issuing a book like On Writing Well by William Zinser or Writing That Works by Raphael and Roman uh, or On Writing by Stephen King himself. Uh, there's just a number of different ways that we could start to shine a bright spotlight on the craft of writing. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like I was saying like, oh, they're the words, to, they're like, they're the writing people. It's like, no, man, that's like, that's like saying um, that, you know, it, it's not everybody's responsibility to prospect. It's not everybody's responsibility to like block. Like if you're not, the, if you're not actually the, you know, the ball carrier in any given play, like, guess what? You're a blocker. Like in fact, yeah, like yeah. the quarterback, the, like the quarterback's a blocker as soon as right, like the kicker is a, a defender as soon as he's done kicking, right? Um, yeah, I think a couple of the different ways that we um, uh, help with that, and we've seen our customers do that, is like one one thing that we do um, in our organization that's kind of fun is I get a lot of prospect emails. Weird, right? Yep. I'm at, I'm at, I imagine you do as well, mm -hmm. um, and um, we uh, will like we'll put them into our, our SDR uh, team Slack channel and just be like, cool. And like, just workshop it, right? They're like, hey, what do you guys think about this? Uh, what do you think about the subject line of this text preview? Right, oh, and then they, 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 they kind of go off on it, right? Um, and um, yeah, or like, um, or then they like do the, do the content as well. I swear to goodness. And so like now it's a, it's a thing that we do. Like, so anybody who gets like a prospecting email will just like dump it in there like, you know, one of our um, uh, our senior marketing manager 
had one. Um, our VP of marketing gets them a lot too. And like, sometimes you can pick up good things like, oh my goodness, the, um, the SDR, <laughs> probably the best SDR experience that we had recently was an SDR from Qualified. The, okay. um, the chat, the chat bot company, I forget the, the woman's name, um, but it's not surprising because um, the gentleman who used to run SDR at a qualifies a guy named Elon Kopecki. Oh, um, I know. And, well, great guy. Former Salesforce yeah, he, guy. Yep. Salesforce, yeah. Yammer, et cetera. Yeah. He's over in, um, he's over in Atlanta now, but he's mm -hmm. just like extremely, extremely competent at the craft. This, like the, like, we essentially like are having a love fest for this SDR in our like pipe gen Slack channel because she had like not only um, she had multi threaded our organization like excellently and each multi thread was like very 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 good like mm -hmm. her messaging to the senior marketing manager her messaging to the VP of um, a VP of marketing was all like like a very like personalized but also of course tied to the relevant um, you know the relevant need um, and so and then we like took away good like good example like you take away bad examples like hey don't do that like oh my god are you <laughs> there's literally checking in is in the preview text i know it's brutal why are you why are you even trying right and then like so like hey guys this is a reminder you like if you if you go to type the word checking in just like slap your own hand right like there's like there's like bad things like hey remind as a reminder everybody don't do this and then you pick up good things too so that, that's well, one thing that we do oh go ahead to, to your point when you're highlighting the a players out there like like uh the one from elon's team uh you are subtly raising the standards of your team that way when the when the checking in one comes across the wire you don't even have to post it in the in the group chat everybody they they're already aware of it and keen to it because all they've been looking at is the good copy and uh, aspiring to to write better themselves so it it'll happen through osmosis that way if you're just focusing the effort on what great looks like they're going to they're going to fly in formation sooner than later yeah the other thing that we see ends up being pretty um, power, like kind of a key use a more sophisticated but a key use case for for atrium is you know identifying the secret kind of like the secret sauce of what makes somebody a high performer and so usually what ends up happening is like you have a high performer that like they say let's say in sdr land they have a high opportunity creation rate or like you know from an account executive standpoint like they've got like high bookings or whatever and so then you what you end up kind of looking at is um actually i think i've sent some of these to you ralph or maybe given to you yes. when we when we've yeah. had had lunch yeah, yeah like you just look at the various metrics and you can kind of see where it's coming from so like an example of this would be sdr like the sdrs are the highest email engagement or the highest responsiveness rates you know what are they doing there right mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes it's like they're doing kind of thoughtful variations on the like sequences there like either they're doing really good personalization or they decided to maybe go a little rogue um, and like, not like a super rogue, but like, you know, like, oh, I'm just gonna put a little of like this in the recipe this time, right? Not like completely different. And then yeah. like great things come out of it. You're like, what, like, what's going on here? Like this person is doing the same volume of email outreach, but their like email responsiveness rate is like two points higher than everybody else. Like WTF, like what's going on there? And then like mm -hmm. you pull on that thread and say, hey, you know, Susie, what are you doing here? Oh, and like, I'll give you an example here. One of the things that we identified when doing outbound prospecting, so uh, ramping is a key use case for Atrium. So a new hire trigger is like really powerful for us. Turns out if you put the name of the new hire in the subject line, pretty good open rate. Yeah, pretty I'm good sure open rate. Is. Right? Hey, uh, Ralph, I saw that you just hired like Frank Williams, or sorry, like Fr Frank Williams. And then like Ralph's like, wait, what? What did whoa, he do whoa. this time? You yeah, open it up. Yeah, open it up. And it's like, Ralph, oh man, congrats on the hire. Can we send you a copy of leading sales development for, uh, you know, for your team? Oh, okay. Right. Um, so like identifying those like, you know, little variations that then drive higher and then you standardize it across the team. And now everybody's response rate is 6% instead of it being like 3%. Yeah. And, and that, that example about Frank is guess what? It's not about you or your product or your company's history. It's about them. It's about their team and a move they made and something that's bolstering their operation and making them better. It's a, it's facing outward and focusing on the recipient of that email. And that's why those reply rates, response rates, and ultimately win rates are going to increase. Yeah. Uh, Miss Garrett's question here. Um, 
uh, ideas on helping avoid SDR burnout. Um, Ralph, I imagine you have some some good opinions on this. Maybe like you know pre kind of COVID, pre work from home, kind of pre hybrid organization, and maybe post as well. Yeah. Uh, wow, the burnout one is a that's a good one. Um, I, I have found the burnout one to be very individual focused. You know, if you're mm. if you're detached from your purpose and your mission and your why, you're going to get burned out really fast. If you don't take time to create space and actually zoom out and see yeah. see where you talked about it earlier, Pete, where you intend to end up in a given time frame, then the mundane, monotonous, repetitive work that sales development yeah. uh, functions require will burn anybody out. Uh, mm-hmm. Rejection from people, you know, uh, there's a there, we're in tumultuous times, but guess what? We were in tumultuous times five years ago, 10 years ago, and 20 years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, spring always follows winter and summer <laughs> always follows spring. I mean, it ha- it's going to happen over and over again. So the burnout is you need to take a deep breath. You need to get back in touch with why you're doing what you're doing. You need to actually stop thinking about yourself and maybe start thinking about those in life who made a sacrifice for you to get where you are today in your career and in life and start to pay that forward, honor the work that they did to get you where you are. And you'll start to be kinder to people. You'll start to be a little more empathetic if you're dealing with people who are, you know, rejecting you or not being cool with you when you do engage with them. And you'll just be a little more Zen about things and that burnout will get mitigated pretty fast. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think um, those are all great. Yeah, they're very Ralph. Be, let's be more Zen. Let's be yeah, more you got to be Zen. And, and I guess my message is, um, you know, I don't know what Garrett's role is, but I appreciate that question. But for those on the call right now and those listening to the recording, I, this is directed at the leaders. You know, m- a lot of the times leaders, you're the problem. You are the ones who are in the way of the reps from being very successful. You know, you're cracking the whip on making numbers. uh, And we understand that that's a very realistic pressure, but you too need to pause, zoom out and take stock of the humans and the people who are on your team and try to do the stuff that doesn't scale and get to know your people as individuals as best you can, regardless of how big your team is. If you have to do it in cohorts, meet with everybody and get a- get a. get a litmus test of how people are doing and how they're feeling and what it is they're trying to accomplish. And I guarantee when you start seeing yourself at the bottom of the org chart and you start serving the people that are in your organization, you're going to go pretty far together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Some kind of like really tactical examples that I like to use there. Um, And also like some of these are my own innovations and what is it like good artists borrow great artists steal love to mm-hmm. s- just steal for, like this is one of the nice things that, like be, like working a at atrium and then also on modern sales pros you just sit in the middle of like all the sales excellence so um a couple tactics um quarterly dinners with your reports right um you know to the extent you can do that i've actually found that like zoom dinners are like not terrible i mean they're not amazing mm. but they're not terrible they're not actually terrible right. um and um, like I literally just had dinner with um, one of my sales managers last night at Perry's on Embarcadero. It was lovely. We're Love looking it. at the bridge. I know, yeah. exactly. Perry's is his Full favorite moon. spot. Yeah, exactly. Um, the uh, so, so definitely do that. Um, How about thank you, know, you cards? Send them a thank you. Hey, Pete, you know, I know a lot of people aren't going to tell you this, but I recognize the hard work that you're putting in day in, day out. I know it's a bumpy road. It's not as smooth as we all want to see, but- I recognize what you're up to, man. You know, keep it up. You got a lot of resources internally here that can help you get where you're going. Uh, thanks for doing what you do. That I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and like super low. Here, I'm going to run over. I'm on the sales floor and I'm going to run over here. So our SDR yeah. team broke their, their off creation record last month. And so we were just like, all right, cool. Like, let's just get them cute little Boom. Yetis making it rain ops right yep. like these are like here's what's on my desk they were like just 30 bucks blank thank you cards it says thanks a ton on the front and then you open it it's blank and you just you take a thick black sharpie pen pete you're the man i'm watching you keep at it boom pretty simple <laughs> i love it yeah one of the things and then 
so then what you have to start thinking about is like when you get bigger, you have like these programs ideally scale in some sort of capacity. I know like um, sales loft, gosh, this was like a, an MSP thread, like it must've been like four years ago. Cause like Kyle Porter wrote a response on an MSP thread, <laughs> which is like, now it's like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> He's got like way more important things to, to work on right now. But like he was talking about the micro promotion um, yeah. stuff that they had going at sales loft, which was like super awesome where, yeah. um, you know, like I think after your first number of opportunities, you got like um, the fancy pants headset or like maybe it's a wireless headset versus a wired one. And then, and after the next few, like the next set of ops, you got a, um, you know, you get your college flag, right? Like goes above your desk. Um, and a lot of these things were like things that like other people could see, like on the floor. So they're like, uh oh, they oh. just got theirs. They're like, uh oh, where's yours? Right. Little um, badges. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then that, and then, um, and like actually what, what we did, do I have them on? I think I think I actually gave them all away and I have to like order more from Amazon. So what we do is like add every like there's like op creation threshold. So at like 50, 150, 300, you get a little mm. like desk desk swag where it's like because nice. everything at Atrium is like fox themed. And so th these are like these onyx foxes that then go on people's uh people's desks. So awesome. I think like doing things like that, yeah, like where you can just like systematize it in a way that like A has like um has uh what you, like you know has waypoints along the way that kind of like breaks up time and then also can be like a nice little like badge of honor i think those those things can be really powerful as well um Absolutely. actually kind of kind of related to that um i know that you guys have a fairly remote or a totally remote sdr team right now um any kind of like you know points of view on on managing and also i mean specifically like teaching and training uh, junior staff in a remote environment because I think one of the things that um, that I find is that a lot of SDRs are kind of like you know they're fresh out of college or fresh out of like maybe they're career switchers they're coming out of like you know hospitality or or what have you and there's like a lot of stuff around the edges to like to learn that are a lot easier to learn when you're sitting next to somebody mm. um, and kind of like can lean over um, you know what are some things that you found that to, that have like you know helped with that. Uh, one thing that's really helped us is we, we actually interview for it. You know, we, we, in the recruiting phase, we're interviewing for professionals who are going to demonstrate self-sufficiency and self-discipline, uh, again, getting in touch with the why and what their mission is, what it is they're really trying to accomplish in their career arc. Uh, and then when they're in the role, we're very prescriptive about what we expect for each day, each week. And we're usually listing the, the outcomes versus like the inputs, you know, Pete, mm -hmm. 8 AM, we want you on phones. No, instead we say, Hey, Pete, by end of week, we'd like to see you here. And, uh, and then beneath that, we get into making sure we gather frequently as a team, making sure communication mm -hmm. lines are always open via Slack or otherwise the zoom calls you talked about. Uh, and Zoom lunches are always important, but we also want to be very clear with everybody that, hey, you, we're not going to be sprinkling these into your days and weeks constantly because we actually have work to do and we're trying to run a business here, but these are going to be available so that you've got that sense of camaraderie you need, you've got the guidance you need, you've got a sounding board, you can hear what's good, what's not. Uh, our One of our uh, sales development leaders at Trey, for example, holds daily standups, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And those standups uh, are attended by the entire sales development team. They're no more than 15 minutes. And oftentimes one of the SDRs facilitates or hosts those standups. So everybody's now accountable for kind of pulling their weight and it seems to really help. Yeah. Yeah, I like the standup thing. I mean, our operating rhythm for our SDR team is we've got, um, yeah, 9 a.m. standups um, uh, every day. Um, we've got an SDR like pipe gen meeting, or, like SDR specific meeting on um, uh, on Monday morning at um, at 11. And then they also roll into the sales team meeting as mm -hmm. well, nice. just so they can have, you know, kind of proximity to see like what's going on with AE land, what's going on with, um, you know, all, all of that. Um, it ends up, I mean, it's like a non-trivial amount of time, but it's important for kind of like 
aligning people and then also like there's good professional development in it like if you under if the SDR team understands the implications like downstream like oh they like I'll give you a good good example so one of the kind of superpowers of atrium is that you know it takes like three minutes to set up an account right so any like any person within an organization if you're an SDR manager an AE manager or a sales operations person you can just go to atrium and like you know click turn on an account sign in with the Salesforce and you're on your merry way and um, so we call those data lights internally, right? Mm. That's like our, our kind of phrase. And so the SDRs are always here about like, you know, in our sales team meeting, we're reporting on how many data lights there were last week and how many per rep and like where we're at this month. And like, cause it's a good precursor to like data lights a day turning into like turning to close one in like 45 days, right? So then right. now they know upstream, they're like, okay, that's like, yeah, I'm putting, I'm putting ops on the board, but like better, even better, we want them to like light up data. And so you have like better cohesion there so much so that like the S some of the SDRs had a realization they're like, hey, you know, when we did those pre-discovery questions, why don't we just like recommend to people that they turn on an ATM account before they have their meeting? And it was like, oh, duh. Yeah, that's I really love that. that's a That's a really good idea, guys. And they're like, yeah. oh, okay. So like, that's like a CTA in that, that was an additional CTA in that pre-disco thing where it's like, hey, you know, let us know about your priorities. Also, if you happen to have five minutes, you can just turn on an Atrium account ahead of time and you'll be able to tour, to, tour through it with your, um, you know, with the AE when you, when you meet up with them. And of course, like, so that was, that was a benefit of kind of that, that like cohesion there. Mm -hmm. It's also good from a professional development standpoint um, as well. Um, so I know that we're, we're kind of running up on time here, but one of the things I wanted to ask you is when um, there's a lot of folks who are kind of like new to management and new leaders, you know, what are your kind of like your biggest recommendations and what have you to, to new leaders? Ooh, uh, to new leaders, make sure you're very clear on the, the level of standards you plan to drive in your organization and be prepared mm -hmm. to illustrate those standards. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, take stock of your, disposition and your attitude and your demeanor around your team and particularly in hairy situations, uh, because that <laughs> whole team is observing how you respond to things. And if you're losing your mind and you're frantic and you're stressed, your team will be as well. And they'll end up uh, taking credibility of point, points away from you because you can't handle your business. So stay calm and in control, but understand the standards you plan to illustrate and the outcomes you plan to drive. I love it. These are, uh, these are excellent. Uh, these are excellent recommendations. Um, well, well, Ralph, thank you for, for taking the time to hang out today. Um, uh, folks, we have a really great guest coming in next week as well. Uh, Emily Carpenter, who's the VP of commercial sales at Heap. She's super rad. She used to be at, uh, she used to be at trip actions. I forget where she was immediately before that, but she's like, just awesome sauce. Um, this yep. is one of the benefits I get of uh, uh, working in Atrium is like, not only do we get to meet lots of great sales leaders, we're able to figure out very quickly who, which of them kind of have their act together versus the ones who are maybe <laughs> less modern sales pros. <laughs> maybe, right, right. What do we call the old, old school? <laughs> Old school sales. Trip. Yeah, Emily's absolutely fantastic. Um, so please join us next week. And, um, and Ralph, have a have an awesome weekend. Okay, man. You too, Pete. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks, everybody for joining us today. Okay, see you, Ralph. See ya.